Welcome everyone to the second evening and the second lecture in our exhibition season contagion. As I said yesterday, I will repeat again and I probably won't have to stop saying that. We are living in a very, very difficult and terrifying moment. We're all trying to make sense of what's going on around us. And I feel privileged to have colleagues like Sheila Jasanoff yesterday and Gautam today and others who will come along in the series over the next 45 days, who will hold our hand and help us understand the decades of knowledge making they have done in order to arrive at good questions, good understandings and reliable knowledge about what the phenomenon of contagion is, whether it, con con whether it, it, it concerns disease, sometimes it might concern ideas, Sometimes it might concern behaviors as well. So I also feel privileged that we have in our very young presence in India or our very presence actually at all, we've been supported by incredible institutions of learning and of research. This lecture series for Contagion has been supported by the Indian National Science Academy. And so I would like to thank Professor Chandrima Shah, who is also in the audience today. Allow me to introduce to you today's speaker, although I'm very well aware that those of you especially um, who are keeping an eye on social media are, are very well aware of it, not just social media, but also media in general, Gautam's presence is noticed and is appreciated hugely for being a researcher of depth who is helping those of us not from the domain of understanding epidemics to make sense of what's going on and why we might think of it the way um, he and coll other colleagues have been helping us uh, push ideas further. So um, Gautam is a professor of physics and biology at Ashoka University and an adjunct professor at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He has been and continues to be so a professor at, the, at what is called Math Science or the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Chennai. He spent two decades as professor or with the theoretical physics and computational biology groups at Math Science, uh, where he was the founding dean of the computational biology group. All of this to, in many ways, give ourselves the confidence and for those of you who haven't yet had, had the opportunity to get to know Gautam and his work, that he comes with significant work in this area. He completed a PhD from the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore, followed by postdoctoral work at TIFR Bombay and Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. He's a physicist and mathematical modeler by training with interests in biophysics, disease epidemiology, and science communication. So uh, just, in fact, after uh, I took up this position, uh, very shortly thereafter, uh, Gautam and his colleague Rahul had organized what in the last few years has been a rather successful workshop in science communication. So, you know, that's also an area he's been committed to, which explains his presence in the media and in the public domain through the last one year, helping us make sense of this. Today, Gautam is going to talk to us about why and how should we model infectious diseases. In order to help us understand what is modeling, what is modeling a disease, what does modeling an infectious disease look like? How is it done? And most crucially, why would that matter? Over to you, Gautam. Thank you so much, Anvi. Let me begin by sharing my slides, which I will assume you can all now see. Welcome to all of you. I want to tell you about why and how we should model infectious diseases. And this is a problem, of course, that has a long and interesting history. But we're going to approach this in the sort of four, in the sequence of four points. First of all, I will tell you what are infectious diseases in the first place. Then I will tell you, I will try to make you appreciate what is a model in the first place. Then we'll go on to what can a model tell us? And finally, are models useful? So these are the four ideas, the four pillars on which I will build this talk. The first question is, where does disease come from in the first place? Why is it that some of us fall ill, some of us stay well? And the old idea here is the idea that disease is something that spreads in the atmosphere and the air around us. There's a miasma that surrounds us. And occasionally some of us fall prey to that miasma and fall ill, whereas the others stay oh, well. Okay. So this doesn't assign a particular cause. It just says that, look, you have some likelihood of falling ill because disease is all around you. 
in a sense, what I consider to be among the most significant scientific breakthroughs of the last God knows how many years, comparable even to quantum, to quantum theory or the theory of relativity, is the germ theory of disease. And the idea that infectious diseases are caused by microorganisms that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. So these can be bacteria, they can be viruses, and I will show you some examples of these as we go along. The idea that diseases are caused by small organisms that are associated with people who are ill actually goes back a long way. So the famous uh, Persian philosopher and scientist, Ibn Sina or Avicenna as he's known, really developed the idea of quarantine because he remembered that he, he, he understood that sailors coming in from far parts may be carrying diseases with them. And so he would wait, he, he counseled that, they be, that their ships be left outside, not allowed to enter port for a certain while so that those diseases could go away and these people could be cured. The idea of germ theory goes to a bunch of people from Fracastoro in Italian, to Pasteur and Koch, better known names. And these are names, of course, that are associated with this great breakthrough. The idea that diseases could be associated with very specific organisms that were too small to be seen with the naked eye, yet nevertheless existed. We're going to talk about infectious diseases in this talk, and I'm going to not talk about what are called non-communicable diseases, diseases that you cannot get from someone else. And in that category would fall cancer, would fall diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Where if someone else has it, you will not get it from them. In order for Pasteur and Koch to make these statements that they did to, to lay the foundations of the germ theory of disease, it had to wait to the development of microscopes for us to be able to really see something that was too small to be seen with the naked eye. So the microscope that you see was a microscope used by Hooke, by Robert Hooke. And Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the Dutch scientist, was also responsible for many breakthroughs in, in constructing both the lenses as well as the microscopes that use these lenses to be able to image, to be able to look at something that was really, really small. So that's a picture, a sort of microscope picture, something big enough to be seen under a normal, what's called an optical microscope. And this is Streptococcus pneumoniae. And that's a bacterium of that particular form. It's a bacteria of that form. This is a more serious microscope. It's an electron microscope that's used to use see things. And the word see is used in a somewhat general context because it turns out that you can't see things in quotes when they're really, really small, as for example, a virus is. And that's what it looks like. And in Bangalore, you have, of course, a certainly a, one of the better electron microscopes in the world that's used for studying materials. But it's instruments like this that are really responsible for our ability to image something like this. So the picture to your top left is a picture of the coronavirus, the virus that afflicts all of us today. And the picture in the center, the large picture with the little red items pointing out of what looks spherical really is an image of the coronavirus. The coronavirus in this case is a general term for the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the disease of COVID-19. So that's what the virus looks like. It's a large virus as viruses go. And in order to see it, one needs a measuring device such as the electron microscope that I showed you on the previous slide. So let's look at the definitions of different terms. An epidemic is an infectious disease that spreads to many people, yet is still confined to a community or a city or a country. A pandemic is when an epidemic escapes the borders of a single, city, of a single town or a single country and then spreads across many countries of the world. Right now, the pandemic that we're living through, the COVID-19 pandemic, has spread to over 220 countries all across the world. Most countries that are recognized by the United Nations have in fact been afflicted by cases of the coronavirus, of the disease caused by the coronavirus or COVID-19. We can go back in history and you will hear about this history from other speakers in this series. And that's the history of one major epidemic, one major pandemic in the last 110 years approximately. And that's the influenza pandemic or the Spanish flu pandemic. And this is, you can see in this picture, this line of, of this ward of, of patients suffering from Spanish flu. And Spanish flu spread across the world over the period roughly January 1918 to December 1919, approximately two years, a little less than two years. It was called Spanish flu, but this was a misnomer. It really didn't have very much to do with Spain, but spread out from Europe and from the United States across the world. Spanish flu, as we call it, infected around 500 million people at that time, about 100 years ago. And at that time, this was 25% of the world population. 
and a large number of people died. And even here, the estimates are not very good because we have to go back in history to try and understand what those numbers actually meant. And they, many people died in areas where records of deaths were not kept very carefully. So we estimate now, in the modern age, that between about 30 million and 50 million people actually died of the Spanish flu. India was particularly hard hit by the Spanish flu and around 15 to 20 million died in India alone. And at that time, this was about five to 10% of our population. So that's roughly one in 10 people dying of a disease like Spanish flu. This is very much a part of our history in a sense. It's just that we've forgotten the details about it. Mahatma Gandhi contracted Spanish flu and his daughter-in-law and her young son died of it. So it really is part of, of, of the historical, of, of, of what happened to major figures of that period. And the famous writer, the Hindi writer and poet, Surikant Tripathi, otherwise known as Nirala, lost his wife and several members of his family to the flu. And he says, my family disappeared in the blink of an eye. All our sharecroppers and laborers died, the four who worked for my cousin, as well as the two who worked for me. My cousin's elder sister was 15 years old, my young daughter a year old. Whichever dark direction I turned in, I saw darkness. So where do these diseases come from? We said they came from microorganisms. We mentioned the words bacteria and viruses. So how do they move between people? So bacteria and viruses move between humans either directly or indirectly. Directly is through some sort of direct person-to-person -person contact. For example, a handshake is one way of transferring the bacteria on your hand to somebody else's hand. You can also have indirect contact. You can touch something that someone later comes and touches. For example, a doorknob in that particular example. You can sneeze into the air or just breathe heavily so that little droplets from your chest have little covered with mucus from your chest come out and they can be inhaled by someone else. And this route seems to be the route through which COVID-19 is actually transferred from person to person. This is by through airborne droplets that float around in the air, which is why mask wearing is very critical to controlling the spread of COVID-19. So here is an example of how the room, a closed room fills up with little droplets capable of infecting someone containing COVID-19. So imagine that this person there in that picture is infected with COVID-19 and is just simply breathing out or is talking or is singing or is shouting, etc. And this is a measure, the little tiny little dots surrounding that person after two minutes, 15 minutes and one hour is the amount of droplets that they're surrounded with that someone who comes into the room can potentially ingest. So if you're silent, it takes a long time. It's just regular breathing that takes these droplets and pushes them out. If you're talking, many more droplets. If you're shouting, even more droplets. So you, you emit 50 times more droplets, the number of particles when you shout, than you do when you are silent. So this points to the need of thinking about ventilation. And one thing that you can do if you're in the, the company of a person who is, who is infected with COVID-19, of course, stay masked, stay away as far as, as far as you can, remain masked, but the other thing is just to encourage air to flow through the room from inside to outside so that you ventilate the premises where you happen to be. Some diseases come through a somewhat indirect route to human beings. So they come to us from animals, for example, from bats, from poultry. Such diseases that come to human beings from animals are called zoonotic diseases. And these bats, poultry, etc., are called natural hosts for these viruses. And an event in which a virus for which an animal is its natural host moves to human beings is called a spillover event. And this word is important, spillover. So many of the diseases in the last 20, 21 years that have afflicted humankind, for example, the disease called SARS that came briefly through the South of Asia around 2003, 2004, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome that is still there in parts of Saudi Arabia and parts and countries surrounding Saudi Arabia. It recurs from time to time. And of course, COVID-19 are all examples of zoonotic diseases. COVID-19 is believed to have come from bats into some intermediate animals such as a pangolin and from there into a human being. It's important to remember that three out of four new diseases or emerging diseases that are infectious come to us from animals. And that points to the importance of understanding disease in a broader context of thinking about the ecology of disease or disease ecology as it's called. And thinking about diseases in humans, in animals, in ecological context is called a one health approach to disease. And this is a word that you will be hearing a lot about hopefully in the years to come because it's a very important and significant idea. What protects us from falling? And why is it that we aren't all permanently ill all the time with flus and colds and infections and bacteria surrounding us? The reason is that any prior contact with a virus or a bacterium 
helps your immune system recognize it the second time it comes around. So it recognizes the invader and deals with it. So what vaccinations do is to create that immune memory of a prior infection. It gives, it sends you something, it signals your body that something foreign has entered it. Your body prepares to deal with it. And then later when it actually comes, when it's actually prepares to infect you, the body can then sweep it up as fast as possible. So the creation of immune memory and to prevent foreign bodies that are foreign to your, that are not part of yourself or non-self is really the function of your immune system. The question of how do diseases affect populations is the field of epidemiology. And you can imagine that at any instant of time you have a population, the population of Bangalore, the population of Delhi, the population of Sonepath where I happen to be currently, is a mix of people, a large number of whom are in good health and some fraction of whom are in bad health. That's in that little pie chart that you can see below there. The proportion of those with ill health changes over time. It goes up and down, it goes up and down. What we'd like to do is to understand models for that proportion with health and how it changes over time. And there's these models that we want to think about as we go along. Here's a picture that some of you may have seen, but I guess that most of you have not seen. It's a picture of a bunch of black and white regions over there. And it seems to have no particular structure or no particular meaning. If you stare at it long enough, some things begin to strike your eye. And suddenly you begin to understand what that picture is all about. The next time you come to see it, you will recognize those features inside this picture that you didn't recognize the first time around. They leap out at you. What your mind is doing, what is creating patterns and structures out of what it sees and trying to interpret that in a particular way. This is not normally used as a metaphor for a model. But I just decided that I would use it just to show you how it is that we construct meaning from observations. For example, an observation of just a set of black and white blotches, as you can see in this picture. So what we want to do is to look at something like this. So what's plotted on the y-axis vertically is the number of people ill at a particular time, or the number of, in this particular case, is the number of cases of people ill on a particular day across March to January of 2021. And you can see that this goes up and it comes down. And what we'd like to do in the, at its peak value is close to 100,000 people. When it started off as close to zero people, I mean, it's come down, it's probably around 9,000 to 10,000 people. And this is something that we'd like to understand. Where does the structure of this curve come from? How do I understand it? How do I know, how can I figure out that it cannot have, should not have crossed 100,000 or should not be 10 times larger than 100,000? And it, it's guaranteed at some point to come down. But the question is, where is that point and where is that peak? So this is where I look at an, a graph like this. I look at data like this. And I'd like to ask, what is it? How do I understand it? And, what? and that's where the idea of a model comes into play. So imagine that I showed you this graph here, but I showed it to you at different times. I showed it to you in May. I showed it to you in July. I showed it to you in September. I showed it to you in November. And then I asked you to predict what it might do. For example, in, in March, it might have looked like this. This is daily new cases, a function of time. You can see it take off. If I looked at it and I asked you, what would it do? And maybe you'd say that it did this. And that's what it actually did in another couple of months. Maybe this might be August. And then if I wait a little longer, this might be October. And if I wait a little longer, it would have come down all the way, just like that picture that I showed you. But here the question is, if I knew that it was going to do this, can I say where it's going to go up? Can I say where the maximum of this will be? What is the point at which it begins to turn down? How fast will it turn down? Will it come right down all that way? Or will it linger a bit? Does it look the same on this side as on this side? These are all the questions that we might want to ask when we think about a question posed by the data that we might see. In this particular case, a number of cases per day as a function of time. So why should you construct a model for what I showed you earlier? Why would it be useful to tell you what's going to happen in the future, to have some idea of what's going to happen in the future? The reason is that you will then know what to expect and what to plan for, even if that was the worst case. And there are things that you could do to prevent it from going all the way up and also helping it to come down faster. So these might be interventions. And then you could ask if I could intervene in some way, maybe have a lockdown, maybe give everybody a mask and ensure that they wear it, maybe quarantine everybody for long periods of time. These are interventions that I could make in my population that would change the shape of that curve. And a good model will tell me exactly how it has to change the shape of that curve and what that particular shape depends upon. Where will it peak and how will it come down? 
So I draw a smooth line for you, but of course it's not a smooth line. And the picture on the right is an actual measure of daily confirmed COVID-19 case. And you can see it sort of goes up and down, goes up and wiggly. And if I try to draw with my hand, not taking my hand off the, off the page, I try to draw a line through it, then it might look a little bit like the picture that I showed to your left. But I have to remember that there are fluctuations about this gradual smooth behavior. So when I'm talking about a picture like that, where I imagine smoothly drawing a line with a pencil on a piece of paper, I should remember that the actual situation <clears throat> is a little more complicated and resembles a picture on the right-hand side. That's where the broad trend comes from. So why it goes up and down in this wiggly sort of manner is really something due to natural variation. So other words for it are random or stochastic. And for that, you have to remember that not every exposure to someone who's infected leads to an infection. Not all infections lead to a disease. These the lines, all that is gold does not glitter, not all those who wander are lost, is a sort of expression of the fact that there is some amount of randomness in this whole proceeding. Of course, there are many other reasons why a graph, a curve like that of the number of, con of confirmed COVID-19 cases should show that particular wiggly structure. Maybe you're not testing enough for COVID. Maybe you're testing less today and than you did yesterday. Maybe you're delaying reporting cases of COVID-19. Maybe you're just collecting all of them until a week is over and then you're sending them all together to the person who manages to collect all this data. Maybe you're lying about your data. Maybe you're concealing the number of cases in your city or your district. Maybe it's just plain inaccurate. Maybe your tests for your disease don't work at all. And then you have to say, you have to say that maybe it's just the fact that you took a good batch of tests versus a bad batch of tests is reflected in the wiggliness of that curve that you see to the right. And these are much harder to account for and to be, to be able to draw a smooth line telling you what the average behavior is if I showed you the jagged line to the right. So let's deal with some history before we get into the idea of describing what was modeled. And I think this history is interesting because it tells you that there is a context to everything that we talk about. That context is often to be found in what happened many years ago. And this is a story, it's often a heroic story of people who did great things, but are not well enough known. So the first person I want to tell you about is this gentleman here. He's called John Snow. And he was famous in 1854 for something called a cholera outbreak study. He studied cholera at that time. He came from humble beginnings. He was the son of a coal yard laborer who then became a doctor. And during the cholera epidemic between 1848 and 1849, he worked in London. And he was a person who discovered or first suggested that water pumps could be a source for the disease of cholera, which as you know, is a waterborne disease. How he did this is an interesting case. What he did was, so here is a map of a certain area in London, at the center of which is called, is a street called Broad Street. Each dot on this map is one single case of cholera, is a household of a, of a case of cholera. The, what's marked with X's on this picture are pumps, the locations of pumps in that region. So John Snow looked at this and he said that, look, around pump A on Broad Street, there seem to be some number of cases that are clustered. The people there are unlikely to have gone very far to get water for their household. So maybe the solution is that something was wrong. Or something was, was, was had to be dealt with regarding the pump that was located on Broad Street. So Mr. Snow recommended that the pump be shut down. He said, maybe the pump is a source of cholera infection. He removed the pump and the outbreak ended. He did this at a time when there was no knowledge of bacteria or viruses, but he identified water as being a primary vehicle for transmission of the disease. So let me tell you a little bit more history. And this has a little slice of India in, in, inside it. And this has the cities of Kasoli, Almora, Mumbai, Kolkata, Bangalore. And I left out Hyderabad, but Hyderabad is also very much a part of this. So these cities are important because they have a certain special place in the history of models in epidemiology. So Ronald Ross, who lived between 1857 and 1932, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1902 for his discovery of the life cycle of the malarial parasite. He was born in Almora. He, he joined the Indian Medical Service in 1881. He worked in Bombay and Kolkata and Hyderabad. When he was posted in Bangalore, he noted the connection between water and mosquito control and went back, investigated this more carefully and saw the first stages of growth of the malarial parasite. He mapped out these stages of growth of the malarial parasite in the mosquito. 
But the most famous mathematical model or model in general of infectious diseases was first developed by two scientists, one of whom had an Indian connection. I want to tell you about this. It was not recognized for many years until finally people discovered that this model had all of the right ingredients in it. It was the simplest model that you could think of that had the grains of the truth of how to think about or how to model infectious diseases. It is called the SIR model. So that's why the letters SIR are. And we'll try and understand where these letters come from and why it's called the SIR model. But let me tell you a little bit about the people involved. The people were two people, both Scottish, one called McKendrick and one called Kermack. McKendrick was born in Scotland. He trained as a doctor. He joined the Indian Medical Service, exactly as, as, as Ross did, and then became director of the Pasteur Institute in Kasoli. So that's where Kasoli comes in that I showed you on the map. He went back to England in 1920 and became superintendent of the Royal College of Physicians he, from 1920 to 1941. So that's McKendrick's story. That's what he looked like. The gentleman called Kermack was trained as a mathematician, but then became a chemist. And he worked as a chemist for many years at the same college of, 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 of at the same Royal College of Physicians laboratory under McKendrick. He worked as a chemist until an unfortunate incident occurred. He was blinded by an accident in his lab. And for a chemist at that time, of course, being blinded by, by, by an accident meant that you could not pursue chemistry anymore. Because chemistry is a very tactile field. You have to hold things, mix them together, understand how they function, create complicated synthesis, etc. But that was now not open to him as a career option anymore. So he fell back on his training as a mathematician. He could, apparently, he was so gifted as a mathematician that he could work these calculations in his head. And he began to talk to McKendrick about understanding how infectious diseases actually spread and the mathematical understanding of the infectious diseases. So because Kermack, because McKendrick had come back from India, he had data with him about the Bombay plague outbreak of 1906. And that's the, the picture that you can see over there shows you every week the number of infected people during that week. So you can see that in the beginning of that, so this is around 1906, probably starting in, 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 in January of that, of that year and then going on for about 30 weeks. You can see each of those dots is the increasing number of cases plotted in that particular week. So you can see that it starts off low, goes up high, and then comes back down. Okay. By the time you get to week 30, so this is time in weeks, and that week 30 is right at the end when it's come down, which was July 21st, 1906, a certain fraction of the population of Bombay had been infected. And Kermack and McKendrick thought that this is data that obviously calls for understanding. We want to know when it started, how fast the number was rising, when it would peak, and when it would come down. So this was what, what Kermack and McKendrick took as a challenge to thinking about. So they compared the data to the theoretical model. So the data is the data here. And the theoretical model is a line that I will show you that they managed to understand how to fit. But before that, I want to explain what Kermack and McKendrick were thinking about so that you can understand that a little better and understand why their work helps us think about infectious diseases somewhat better and think about how infectious diseases actually spread. So let's do that. Let's spend some time thinking about that particular question, how do diseases spread? And for that, we have to tell you about the SIR model. So the SIR model starts by thinking about disease in a population of individuals. And every individual is different. I'm different from you, it's different from Janavi. All of us, for example, I may have been vaccinated, Janavi may not have been vaccinated, some you may have been, not been vaccinated yet. So all of us are individuals, they're all very different. But the first piece of understanding is from the point of view of disease, and all of our differences matter much less. We all of us can be categorized only with respect to what our status is relative to that particular disease, okay? So you can be susceptible to the disease. Susceptible means I've not been exposed to the disease, I've not been infected by the disease so far, but potentially I could become infected. I could be infectious, which means I could transfer the disease to someone who is susceptible or I could have recovered from the disease. And we can assume that once you've recovered, you won't relapse back and become susceptible again, that that infection protects you for life from contracting the disease once more. So now these people represented by these little circles have little labels on them. They have a susceptible label S, they have an infectious label I, and they have a recovered label R, even though all of them are technically different people, but for the purposes of thinking about disease, I'm going to divide them into just these three categories. I'm going to now take everybody who's susceptible and put them into a box called the susceptible box. I'm going to take everyone who's infected, put them in a box called the infected box. I'm going to take everyone who's recovered, put them in a box called the recovered box. 
So now these are called not boxes, but compartments, if you wanted to be technically correct. We now have three compartments in which we put a number of individuals who are susceptible to the disease, infected by the disease, or have recovered from the disease. And this is where the S, the I, and the R come from in the SIR model. So what I want to ask is how does the number in each of these boxes change? And that's a fundamental quantity that I want to model. How many people are infected today versus yesterday? How many people are infected currently? What are the total number of current people who's infected? What are the number of people still susceptible? So that's a question about the numbers. And now I can see that if, if someone becomes infected, I have to take them from the susceptible box and move them to the infected box. I have to move people between compartments, move these, these, these sort of little circles from one compartment to the other. And that will tell me about how the disease is actually proceeding. A little more of a technical note here, and that's when what happens when you contract an infection with a bacterium or a virus. So the virus it enters you, let's just take that to be the coronavirus, for example, the, the SARS-CoV-2, as it's technically called. Let's suppose you ingest it, you've, you've been breathing in droplets with someone who's infected and walking around in your vicinity has breathed out. So you have those droplets inside you. Those droplets contain virus, the virus attaches onto the cells of your body, then begins to multiply within those cells and the numbers of virus increase. Side by side, your immune system is putting up a defense against these viruses. It's attacking them, it's trying to locate them wherever it's possible. So it's trying to tap these numbers down even as the virus numbers tend to grow. So this competition is what is shown here. So the gray area there is the number of virus inside your body. And you can see as time goes on, time is plotted along this direction. The number of viruses start, they move up to a maximum and then they come down again. So that maximum number of virus there is the largest number of virus. And after that, your immune system has managed to hold it in check. And presumably at the end of that, you have recovered from the disease, okay? Couple of points here. There's a point at which the numbers of virus are building up in your body, but you're not infective to anybody. Okay, so that's called a latent period. There's a time in which the, it builds up in your body, but you haven't shown symptoms yet. That's the incubation period of the virus. And then of course, once the amount of virus in your body, your viral load as it's technically called, is large enough, then that is a, a region, a, a space of time, a, 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 an interval of time when you are infectious to other people. So that's your infective period. And then after that, once the amount of virus in your blood goes down, when your body goes down, then you can, set to have, you can be said to have recovered. So just look at this picture and you can see that you are actually infective as it's shown here before your symptoms start. And that's particularly true of COVID-19 as a disease. You can be infectious to other people, even when you don't know that you have the disease, which is why it's important to be tested for the disease. If you at all suspect that you might have been associated with someone, who is already diseased with it. So I showed you that picture to show you the little compartments at the top. So you have your susceptible compartment, the person who has not contacted the disease. You have a compartment called exposed, which is where the virus is building up in your body. You have an infectious compartment, which is a period in which you are infectious to other people. And then you have your recovered compartment where you have recovered from it. And all of these compartments, I've now introduced a new compartment. It's not the SIR model anymore, but the SEIR model. And that's the sort of model that we think about. That's the simplest model for COVID-19 that we use. So that's your susceptible, you're exposed, you're infected, and you're recovered. Think of these as boxes, and you're taking people from one box, susceptible box, putting in the, expo in the exposed box, the exposed box, putting in the infected box, infected box, putting in the recovered box. So it's this movement of people between boxes that, or compartments that we want to think about. We're going to assume that the chances of someone who's susceptible meeting someone who's infected is the same as if you know, they're just mixing them up all together, even though for the purposes of argument, I've separated them into separate boxes because I can only contract an infection if I'm susceptible and I meet someone who is infected, okay? So as I said, the susceptible people move to the infected compartment if they get infected. The infected people move to the recovered compartment once they recover. But what is required is something a little more. I can't just take people and put them, susceptible people, and put them in the infected compartment. A susceptible person and an infected person must come into contact with each other. They must talk to each other, they must come close by for the virus to move from someone who is infected to someone who is susceptible. So the solid lines tell you the transitions between the boxes, the movement of people between these boxes. But the dash, the dotted line that you see is the influence of one box on the other. In this case, the influence of the infected box, people in the infected compartment 
on people in this susceptible compartment. So one can write down mathematics, and this is what the sort of mathematics that, that uh, Mr. Kermack and Mr. McKendrick did. I'm not going to show you, this. I'm just going to put this there to scare anyone if they wanted to look at a mathematical equation. But these equations that are written here are simply a mathematician's way of describing exactly how someone moves from the susceptible to the infectious compartment, how they move from the infectious compartment to the recovered compartment, and the fact that a susceptible person must be close to an infected person or must contact an infected person in order to be infected. So if I take those equations and I look at the solutions of those equations, and that's exactly what Kermack and McKendrick did. They tried to understand the behavior of the susceptible, the infected and the recovered in the case in which I had a few people initially with the infection, with the plague in the case that Kermack and McKendrick were thinking about. And then we asked, how did the plague spread? How did the peak actually happen? So these, the blue line that you see there are the line for the susceptible. So initially, a large number of people are susceptible to the disease. As they keep contracting the disease, the numbers of infected rise. And finally, I only have a few susceptible people left in my population. The red line that goes up and comes down is the number of infected people. In the beginning, there's only a small number of infected people. But as they infect more and more people, that number begins to rise and rise and rise until it peaks. And then after that, as people recover, people move out of the, of the infected compartment and the numbers of infected come down. Finally, at the end of it, people have either recovered from the disease or they're still susceptible to the disease. And so that's a recovered curve, is the green curve that goes up and saturates in that particular manner. So the curve that we're interested in, the curve that Kermack and McKendrick were interested in, is a red curve that went up and came down because that is what determines what happens to disease. How high does it rise? When does it come down? How long does it take to come down to, let's say, half the value or a fifth of the value of the number of cases every day that you had exactly at the point where it peaked? What sort of questions would you want to ask? You might want to ask, will the disease spread? How many people will be infected by the disease? And you can ask a whole bunch of other questions that are related to thinking about this problem, how many infected people there are, how many susceptible people there are. But it's interesting that the answers all depend upon just one particular number in the simple SIR and the SER model that I told you about. And that number is called the basic reproductive ratio. This is a very important term. So I'd like you to remember this term because this is fundamental to thinking about diseases as we go along. So that answers the question of for every sick person, how many people will be infected? So here is the basic reproductive ratio for a number of diseases. One is Ebola, one is swine flu, one is HIV, one is smallpox, one is measles. And you can see that for Ebola, for every person with Ebola, on average, they will infect two people. For someone with smallpox, on average, they will infect seven people. For someone with measles, on average, they infect 18 people. It's much larger that particular number. So that's how the reproductive ratio changes on average as you go from this. So every disease, every infectious disease carries with it its own reproductive ratio. So why are we talking about the reproductive ratio so much? And if you will remember this old story of the chessboard in which the king put little rice under the, because the king wanted to reward his wazir. And the wazir said, look, I want nothing. I want no gold. I don't want your daughter in marriage. All I want to do is the amount of rice that you get if you put one on the first day, you put one grain of rice on the first square of a chessboard, two grains of rice on the second square, four grains of rice on the third square, etc. So each time you just double the number of grains of rice in the previous square. He said, wait until you fill up the entire chessboard of 64 squares. At the end of it, I want all that rice. Now, this looks as though it is not going to be a large number because it starts with numbers that are very small. One, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. It never really looks like that number is going to get very large. Nevertheless, if you take it and you multiply it by two every time, it turns out that the amount of rice that we could put on the entire chessboard would have essentially bankrupted the king several times over. That's in fact, the amount of rice that almost forms the size of Mount Everest. This is an example of something called exponential growth, where it grows faster and faster and faster as time goes on. So, the difference between a reproductive ratio that is greater than one is that the number becomes larger and larger and larger. If the reproductive ratio is exactly one for every person who is, who is infected, they infect one more one person on average, and then they recover, that person goes on to infect some. So on average, the number stays the same. If the reproductive ratio is less than one, that's when the number starts high, but then each 
at each turn, at each instant of time, you have fewer and fewer people getting infected by that person, and finally the number comes down. So diseases for which the reproductive ratio is greater than one, which is true for all the examples that I showed you, are diseases that can explode in the population. They can become epidemics or pandemics if they spread across the world. Diseases that are less than, that have a reproductive ratio of less than one, is something that will die out in a population. So by the time the curve has come down, that's where the effective reproductive ratio is smaller than one because the number of cases is decreasing from day to day. So this is what, for different reproductive ratios, what the model looks like. And these lines there are the numbers of infected. So the larger the reproductive ratio, the sharper the line, the harder it goes up and, the long, and, and comes down on this side. The smaller the reproductive ratio, the, the, it never rises so high and is spread out over a longer period. So it's sort of spread out like this compared to the very sharp peak. So you can see that the seeds of being able to describe diseases of different types are contained in pictures of that type. So what you have over there is the number who are infected per day, the portion of those infected, and the total number of infected is the picture that you have below. So coming back to Kermack and McKendrick, what they did was to draw the picture that you see here. And there you have the number of infected people, the time in weeks, and the line that you see along with the dots is their mathematical prediction. And you can see that they did, the line does a very good job of capturing the general shape of this particular curve, then numbers of infection, something maybe a little off here and there, but that's fine. We want to understand why approximately it reached that peak and when it would come down and that, that it does actually very well. So this is supposed to be one of the most reproduced or copied books in copied figures in books that work in this field of mathematical epidemiology. So we talked about the SEIR model, but I'm going to make it a little more complicated because I want to think about COVID-19 in a more general way in terms of this model that I said describes diseases like COVID-19. The first thing that I want to do is to make it more interesting in terms of the fact that people are different from each other. So we started off saying people are different, but we're going to ignore that. Now we're going to put some of that difference back in. So one thing to do is to break up each of these compartments into different ages, according to what's called age structuring. So for example, I could put in um, different ages. For example, the first little square there could be the age of zero to 10. The second could be 10 to 20. Third could be 20 to 30, et cetera. So once I have that, I've now split up my population. I've age structured my population of people so that they come into each of these little sub compartments. That's a somewhat better way of thinking about it because I know when I talk about COVID-19, I know that younger people can still get infected, but they're unlikely to have very serious stays in hospital on, on average. Whereas older people have to be protected because the consequences of the disease in an older person is likely to be more devastating than it is in a younger person. How different age groups contact each other is another question. For example, do, do 20 year olds speak more to 20 year olds or to 30 year olds? Do children talk more to their parents? So how exactly do these different age groups contact each other, speak to each other, interact with each other in such a way that one can get a disease from each other? These are called contact matrices that information inside them. Metapopulations, I can think of the disease in Bombay, in Delhi, in Chennai, in Bangalore, in Kolkata. So each of this is a little SIR model in itself. It has a number of cases rising and coming down. But of course, these need not rise and come down at exactly the same time. And people from Kolkata go to Delhi. So the connections between population, Kolkata go to Delhi, go to Chennai, go to Bangalore. So that mixes up this whole situation, mixes up the epidemic in Kolkata with the epidemic in Bombay with the epidemic in Bangalore altogether. So let's get to this question of how many people will be infected. And the answer here depends upon R0, on the basic reproductive ratio. The larger that number, the more people will be infected, as you saw from that picture that we saw earlier. The second question, why should we vaccinate against the disease? And why do people talk about vaccination? What you do is you vaccinate susceptible people. And by, vaccination, by vaccinating susceptible people, you're reducing the value of R0. But what is important to notice here is that you don't have to vaccinate everybody who's susceptible. You just need to reach a certain threshold. And that threshold is called the herd immunity threshold. You've heard this term before, but that's a fraction of people in the, in the population of susceptible who need to be vaccinated before the disease stops spreading. Now, that is very simply related in that little letters, the, the box on the side. Then the fraction of people who have to be vaccinated, it depends upon the reproductive ratio. The larger the reproductive ratio, the larger the fraction of people that you have to vaccinate. 
for the disease of Ebola, it's enough to vaccinate about 50 to 60% of the people because R0, the basic reproductive ratio. I forgot to tell you that it's called R0 or R0. That's the way we refer to it. Whereas for measles, where one person on average infected 18 people, you have to vaccinate around 95% of the population, which is why the measles, the, the MMR uh, vaccine that you get when you are a child is such an important vaccine to get because measles can just spread very rapidly to a population, especially of young children. So this is the important point to remember that vaccinating sufficient numbers and not necessarily everyone in a population yields herd immunity. It protects by being vaccinated, you're protecting other people. Some people may not be able to take the vaccine because they have weak immunities, they're elderly, et cetera. But it's important that as many people who can be vaccinated do consent to be vaccinated and agree to be vaccinated and accept that so that you can protect the people who for whatever medical condition they, have, they may be immunosuppressed, they may be having certain types of medication that makes them less able to, to, to cope with the disease that they're infected with. They cannot have a vaccine, let's say, mount, cannot mount the immune response that a vaccine trains you to do. For that reason, it's important to get vaccinated. So the reproductive ratio, the basic reproductive ratio, R0 or R0, can be split up into three parts of it. And this is important. So I want you to listen to this a little carefully. The first part is described by the Greek letter tau. So that's a little T that you can see there. And that denotes transmissibility. And that is how likely is it that a contact between someone who's susceptible and someone who's infected leads to an infection in the susceptible person. The second term is a C with a bar on top of it. And that's the average rate of contact. How many people are contacting each other anyway? in this population. The D term, the third term there, is the duration of infectiousness. How long is it that someone stays infected? And because I can think of this of the basic reproductive ratio as being made up of all of these three different terms, the transmissibility, the rate of contact, and the duration, that suggests how epidemics can be actually controlled. They can be controlled from the following idea. To, first of all, you, can, you want to reduce the value of R0 or R0. So one way to do it would be to reduce the transmissibility, develop vaccines, use antiretrovirals, for example, in AIDS, that reduces the transmissibility of the virus from one person to the other. Second idea, reduce the contacts between people. And one way to do that is lockdowns, preventing people from going out of home, asking they stay home as much as possible, reducing numbers at, in, in religious occasions, reducing numbers at weddings or funerals, et cetera, et cetera. So what that does is to reduce the C with a line over it, the C bar as it's called. So health education program, they tell people quarantining, that people not mix up together in, in, in high in crowds, quarantining, all of these are ways of reducing the C bar or the mean contacts. The last is to reduce the length of the infectious period, to make that reduce that somehow. So that's where therapeutic interventions, antibiotics in the case of bacterial diseases, anything that helps you boost your innate immunity to get it to cope with the disease better, all of this is a positive. So all of public health directed at infectious diseases is really relies on the reduction of the basic reproductive ratio below one and uses one or the other or multiple ways of dealing with the disease by reducing the transmissibility, decreasing contacts between people and reducing the length of the infectious period. So now I want to come back to the little picture that I showed you earlier. That's the picture to the left. And that shows the Indian epidemic as it went up, reached a number a little less than 98,000 and came back. So it reached that peak value around September. And, I want, and the picture to the right, the larger picture, is where we are at more or less currently, a couple of days ago. Okay, So you can see the peak. So now that little peak that you saw earlier is just dwarfed by the much larger growth of cases, the almost very steep, almost vertical rise of cases in India. Currently, we're at four 400,000 cases as we were today, as of today morning. And it's not clear what that particular curve does, what where that particular curve will go. But we can think of this in terms of what exactly what I told you earlier, the transmissibility and the average rate of contact and the duration. We can say maybe we can relate why that curve went up, why the reproductive ratio went up to one of these things that we failed to control. What about transmissibility? And the answer is maybe what's happening is that there is a new type of virus, a new variant of the virus, a muted virus that is more easily movable or transmissible between people. And that's why R0 is going up. So that's one explanation. The second explanation is maybe the contacts between people went up. Maybe people relaxed, went out to movies, went out to theater, went to the Kummela, participated in political activities. Maybe they just didn't care. Already just the strain of being shut up for so long was such that they threw caution to the winds, increased their contacts, and thus contributed to R0. The duration of infectiousness 
could have a role. Maybe the new virus also infected, kept you infected for a longer period. That's certainly possible. We don't think it's necessarily the case. And likely it's a combination of explanation between the transmissibility and the average reach, rate of contact. And which one is more important? Is it the variant of the virus? Is it a mutation of the virus? Or is it the fact that people threw caution to the winds around uh, middle of January, early February? That's the question that we're all trying to answer at the moment. So let me summarize, and I think I've finished well in time. I told you a little bit about the background to thinking about infectious diseases. I told you a little bit about the history of infectious diseases and where it came from. I didn't do any real justice to this. And if I had a much longer time, I would have told you more about the history. Then I told you about pandemics. And we discussed the Spanish flu pandemic a little bit at, the, at that point and why it was so important in the history of our own country, in fact, the history of the world. Then I told you about models. And we discussed compartmental models of disease. I used the history to motivate the SIR model and the people who constructed the SIR model. Then we talked about the reproductive ratio and herd immunity. And the idea of the reproductive ratio is very crucial to any thought about infectious diseases. Then we said, let's make it more interesting. Let's make the compartments into sub-compartments according to people's age. Let's make these sub-compartments interact with each other in different ways. So maybe someone who's 80 years old has a smaller contact with someone who's 20 years old. And so they're much more, much less likely to contract their disease from a 20 year old. And then you can explore different ways of dealing with the disease. Maybe you should just insulate all people who are 70 or 80 plus as far as you can. And maybe that will help cope with the disease. That's certainly one idea that people have suggested. And then we talked about metapopulation, which is a little more complicated way of saying that this is a complicated country, what's happening in Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, et cetera, are all different epidemics. They're all, we're all coping with it somewhat differently. And the curves of cases as a function of time look somewhat different. Then we talked about vaccinations and the importance of vaccinations. And I motivated that by describing to you what the reproductive ratio was and how vaccinations helped you push the reproductive ratio down until you reached herd immunity by just vaccinating a sufficient fraction of the people. And given that you know what the reproductive ratio is, you can figure out what is that fraction of people that you must vaccinate in order to protect everybody. And we finally spoke about the logic of public health measures. How do we understand the reproductive ratio in terms of our very modern context of looking at the sudden rise in cases? And then that raises questions of why did that happen? Did that happen because people just threw caution to the winds, as I said, disregarded COVID appropriate procedures? Or did it happen because there is a new variance of the virus coming along? And these just simply spread faster between people. They're just more efficient at spreading between people. So we, all of this is what people who work in modeling infectious diseases would like to understand. This is the sort of things that keep them up awake at night. And slowly, slowly, we're piecing little parts of these together. We're understanding from the experience of the world, from the experience of Brazil, from the experience of the UK, from the experience of the US, from the experience of South Africa, how different countries have coped with different changes in the viruses that have, that, that the different variants of the virus that have hit them. And so you can now try to understand why the experience of all of these different countries may be relevant to us, may tell us what direction to move in, and also tell us what we need to do to be able to cope with the disease at this point, as well as going forward, and what to watch out for. So let me stop there and thank you for your attention, you know, your, your, um, all of the, your, um, yeah, your attention, basically. Thank you very much, Gautam. I think uh, what you have accomplished is to um, help our or help members of the audience, which is what our goal is, uh, who do not necessarily come from uh, studying or practicing natural sciences or engineering, where statistics or mathematics would be in use on a day-to-day -day basis. But also, what and that's what we want to do. That you know, even if you're a historian or you know you are an artist or you are uh, um, you know no matter what your profession is, this concerns all our lives and the pandemic has brought that to the fore uh, better than before in extremely unfortunate ways. But I think what you successfully managed to do is to give us a perspective. Um, and, I, and I loved it that you used history because you know, as a trained historian of science, that, that to me, of course, touches a, touches a, you know, a warm place. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, and as a sort of uh, uh, historian of statistics in, in the closet, um what i what i find interesting is and this is this is something i had not thought of before is that how sampling is a, is a way of attacking scale modeling is yet another way of attacking scale you know what do you do when you can't do 100% census or 100% control uh, then then you know this is this is um, this is what you do and so therefore it is very much an action oriented kind of approach uh, so that's very interesting uh, I do not want to monopolize, uh, uh, you know, the conversation with Gautam because if I want to, I, I will hopefully reach out to him otherwise. 
Uh, what I want to remind you uh, in the audience is that uh, as you have already wonderfully started doing, please put your question and answers in the Q&A box. Uh, we would really love to hear back from you. So please do complete the feedback form also for us so that we know whether you know you are getting out of these sessions what you really wish to get, because that's something that's very important to us as a public engagement institution. Um, and here from, I will start with the questions. So let me start, as they say at the beginning. So uh, some of them will be questions that I might actually not have judgment on Gautam. So I'm going to indiscriminately bring them to you. Uh, to, and and uh, yeah. So let's start with Tarun Chandra Bose, who wants to know, do these, do, does the coronavirus uh, eventually die out in its virulence to end up decades later, as they say, as a common cold? What is, what is the current um, sort of judgment on that? That's certainly a possibility. And this is what is called becoming endemic. Yeah. So there are coronaviruses that cause things like the common cold that are related to, 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 to other sort of viruses that cause the common cold. And they're there, they're sort of steady background. They don't kill anybody. They just make you a little uncomfortable for a couple of days. That's one idea that people have had that this is going to be the ultimate fate of the COVID-19 epidemic. The virus will keep changing until it sort of kills people at a much lower rate. The only concern right now is that the virus manages to, in, to kill some fraction of the people who it infects. If it didn't do that, we'd be fine with it. We'd just be uncomfortable for a few days. And that's mm. what they're concerned. Mm. So a related question is that uh, you mentioned, uh, Harshita would like to know, you mentioned that the spread of MERS recurs from time to time. Is there a reason why? So if you look at the cases of MERS, they sort of keep going up and down a little bit. There's no, I, I think probably now they may have a vaccine for MERS, but it's not, there's no, there's, and the likelihood is it probably moves between a host animal, a human being back to a host animal, et cetera. So this, you should understand it in a larger ecological context. So there must be a reservoir for this disease, for this virus somewhere out there. Mm. And um, so it's sometimes hard to answer very specific questions like this, because that's, it's not clear that there's enough that we will be able to eliminate it altogether unless we eliminate all the hosts altogether, which in general is not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So exactly what is the balance between the host and, and, and the, the, the sort of the natural, the animal host and the human being, and how this moves between, from one to the other is mm -hmm. a delicate question of, of the ecology of disease. Yeah. And that's something that is an important thing to think about. Uh, Abhiruchi requests that you explain spillover briefly. What is it? So the viruses in that, that whose natural home are animals aren't particularly adapted to human beings. So there's no... No, if you just take one, take a virus which, which belongs to an animal and move it to a human being, they will not infect the human being. But occasionally there are changes. Viruses keep mutating. And occasionally there are changes in the sequence of the virus, in the genetic sequence of the virus, that makes it possible for it to affect a human being. Now, if the animal carrying the virus, let's say the bat and the human being have no connection at all, then they stay with the bat or they stay with the animal that the bat, that the bat manages to transfer its, its, its virus to but they won't jump over to human beings until you create the ecological conditions under which that can happen. One condition like this might be just factory farming of large numbers of animals together. Then the people looking after those factory farms come very close in contact with a large number of animals, potentially carrying multiple types of viruses that could someday make the jump from animal to human being. Mm -hmm. We're not sure for specific disease over here, we have a hypothesis that it was a pangolin that was intermediate between the bat and the human being. That might change as we get to learn a little bit more about it. But usually, they're not adapted to come to human beings, but there must be a specific event that involves changes in the virus, probably some stay in an intermediate animal, maybe something further happens in that intermediate animal, and then it comes over to human beings. That's very nice, and it connects into... So, you know, uh, we have tried to collect resources which are varied in nature. So, you know, we have films, we also have games, we have reading material, listening materials, Spotify playlists, etc. all of which to enter the same question. So, you know, apart from getting experts across disciplines, we are also using other resources so that, you know, someone is orally kind of motivated, someone is visually motivated. So to find their own entry point and their, and their comfort a comfortable way into the question. So Lena Bui's film, which is screening for throughout the 45 days, and we have seven such films screening, uh, looks at uh, Vietnamese farmers mm -hmm. 
who work with ducks in order to export the down and, and feathers to China for, you know, making two ways among other things and et cetera. So those of you who have the chance, please do look at the film and Lena Bui will be in conversation um, with, uh, with another person tomorrow. So if you have the time, please do come along. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting question. It is interesting to me, but remember I'm a historian, so I don't know. Uh, Spurti would like to know, is it possible to incorporate noise into biological models? The answer is yes, and that's a different type of models. I sort of drew these very nice and, and, and sort of smooth lines. Imagine drawing them on a paper. But then I showed you that the reality actually was a lot more jagged than that. And you can put in that jaggedness into models. They're different types of models. They're called, the technical word is stochastic models. And people yeah. study those. And the interesting thing about those models are that it's not guaranteed that once it rises, it'll rise to a peak and then come down. Sometimes diseases can just die out altogether on their own especially if the populations tend to be small because you typically don't manage to transfer the disease to someone else before you recover. So these are interesting things that happen when the numbers are small, when you incorporate all of these, as I said, stochastic effects. But that's certainly that noise that you're talking about is certainly important at that level. Okay. So a uh, nice question to, to follow up on. And I'm glad these are sort of brief and very, very precise questions. So, you know, it's really nice to know the audience is engaged. Um, so, uh, Bala Kumarun says that just like various diseases for which we are vaccinated currently, so we are creating antibodies against the disease, is this the only solution when we face contagious diseases and especially sort of probably even more virulent ones in the future? So creating antibodies, is that the only response we can imagine to handle uh, infectious disease? So what a vaccination does is to stimulate your body to recognize the real thing when it actually comes. Hmm. Okay, so what I mean, you, you don't want to have to infect people with the actual living virus so that the immune system builds up a, a barrier against it and attacks it and so on. And then, you know, because then it's a bit risky if your immune system is not able to do that, if it collapses, then that leads to death or very severe illness or to death. So hmm. what you want to do is to be able to provoke it just enough so that when the real thing comes around, you can remember that it had come around. That's called immune memory. Antibodies are just one part of immune memory. There are other parts of immune memory that, that is related to something called T cells that also help to store memory, immun immunological memory against of particular invaders that may have come from outside, foreign bodies, non-self as they're called. And there is no real solution to infectious diseases that does not involve at some level vaccinations. Or if you had a very good drug, a very good antiviral that would work against it, that would be fine. Yeah. But in most cases, you don't have it. In the case of AIDS, there's a cocktail of antivirals that people have that help to suppress the numbers of virus in your blood. So it may not cure you completely, but the ultimate aim, of course, would be to have a virus that protects people from even getting it in the first place. So I think that, again, neatly leads on to the next question, which uh, in a way is a simple question, but given the target age group we have, I think it would be very good to know from someone like you who, they, who our audiences take seriously. So, you know, what are the criteria briefly that define a person to be susceptible? Well, that's a lovely question. It, it, the simple questions are the hardest questions. Yes. Um, so people's susceptibility varies very, very widely. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that you are less susceptible to contracting COVID-19 because for whatever reason, you may have been infected by a virus that is very similar to that in the past. So if it's very similar, then your immune system recognizes the new virus as being similar to the old virus. And then it bounces up the right sort of defenses against it because it can do that. That's one reason why people's susceptibilities can vary. The other reason, of course, is diet, nutrition, socioeconomic class, because the more you're able to protect yourself against contracting the infection by just insulating yourself, you can do more easily, let's say, if you're rich and if you're poor. All of these, that's a social determinant of disease. All of these together are ways that determine are different in ways in which susceptibilities to disease of people can vary. And that's an extremely good question. There's, you know, that, that, there's probably calls for a long and technical answer, but that's just one sort of part of it. Okay. So Avinandanan has a, has a question for you. He says the example you showed had just one peak. So what happens when, you know, um, things in a way go bonkers? Okay, so that's again a very good question. That depends upon a lot of things. First of all, let's look at the sort of disease that sort of keeps coming back, and that's influenza. 
and every year there's a sort of peak in influenza, typically over the over the over the winter season, which is when it spreads, etc. And then it comes back again. So why does it come back again in this peak? Why are there multiple peaks of influenza once you look at it over several years? And the reason is that the influenza virus changes. It's actually multiple viruses that come under the common label of influenza. And they mix with each other, they change, they mutate in such a way that the next time they come around, your body doesn't recognize it anymore. So it doesn't, even if you had a prior infection, you don't react. I mean, you, you're still in danger of contacting the new virus again when it comes around. So that's one reason for the ups and downs. What's happening with, uh, with the coronavirus, with, with SARS-CoV-2, is probably something like that. The virus has changed between last year and this year. You have new variants, what's called the UK variant, the Indian variant, the South African variant. I could give you their technical name, which is probably the right thing to do, but I'll just stick with their informal names for now. That because they have changed, a prior infection may not protect you so strongly. Because they're more transmissible, suddenly they may go and, and, and begin to infect people who've not been infected earlier. If the reproductive ratio for the old strain of virus, for the old virus was low, and suddenly the new virus has a very high reproductive ratio because it's just easier for it to move between people. Then all the people who are protected because many people already got infected are suddenly not protected anymore because now they can get, get it much more easily and they come into contact with the person who's infected. So that would, something usually has to change in the virus before so that your, your body is not able to, to recognize it when it comes around again, usually. And that could also be a feature of the fact that your immune memory will decline this can happen in some particular cases. There are some viruses for which you're guaranteed immunity. If you see it once, you're safe for you're, you're safe for your whole life. But there are other viruses for which that doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Rimpel which says, considering finding R0 is so important to make decisions about what proportion of the population to vaccinate, etc. How does one estimate the RO if accurate information is not available? Oh, that's a very good question. And that usually is a problem that at the beginning of any epidemic, you don't have accurate information. That's really where you want to capture R0. That's where you want to say that, look, here's the number of cases increasing. It's sort of going to three people at a time. Three goes to nine, nine goes to 27, et cetera, et cetera. Just. And it, that calculation of that R0 is very dependent upon the fact that you must have good data right at the beginning. So it's a long and complicated procedure by which people who work in statistics look at the number of cases and how they start off. They look at multiple countries, they look at multiple cities. They try to make other types of models like the models I told you about to try and describe that, but which incorporate this uncertainty about the number of cases. Mm -hmm. Let's assume they're only measuring a small number of cases in the beginning, then what would that number be? And usually they say R0 is somewhere between two and seven and that's the best that we can do. It can't be much larger than that. It can't be much smaller than that. And then as time goes on, they're able to narrow those bands a little more until mm. finally you have a number that looks reasonable, that is not widely uncertain. So that's mm. how people normally do it. Yeah. Uh, again, a question seemingly simple, but something that, you know, all of us that who are even trying uh, level best without knowing much to make sense of what's going on around us. Uh, Guy 3 has a question which says, could multiple peaks be a result of the relaxation of the lockdown and other governmental policies or could it solely be because of the the you know the virus basically and its mutation right like i mean and this is something we've been struggling to answer that's a, that's a that's a great question again yeah. and so to answer that let me take you back to that the way i wrote the reproductive ratio down i said it depends upon three things and they're very intuitive first of all how easy it is to give the to give the virus to somebody if i'm infected and that's a, that somebody is is susceptible that's the transmissibility part of it if the virus changes, if it becomes more transmissible, then even though I was not, I had only the same level of contacts between people as I did earlier, it would still give you a rise. The mm -hmm. second part is the contact part. How many people does a person or on average contact? So between the lockdown where you hardly saw anybody except your immediate family and sort of going out theaters, meeting people, restaurants, etc., there's a big difference. So that's the contact part of it. So as I said, it's mainly an argument about was it transmissibility or was it contact? It's contact that's political parties, meeting, gatherings together, et cetera. That's the contact part. The other part is the change in the virus. It's possible that both of these went together and you can't completely neglect one with respect to God. It's only this or only that. There's hmm. certainly no doubt that compared to say August or September of last year, there was much more, you know, there was much more mingling, let's say, of people in January and February of this year compared to that period of time. So that certainly the contacts went up. But did the contribution of the change in the virus, did that contribute much more? 
these are the questions that we need to try and answer. We have no good answer to that particular <laughs> question, except to say that in some cases, for some of these variants, we know that they're more transmissible. Hmm. So, which is uh, which, which sort of in a way leads to the answer to the next question, which is uh, where Ramya is asking, can the R not differ from strain to strain of each disease? Yes, it can. Exactly, it can. It can differ from variant to variant. And for example, the, the newer variants may be twice as transmissible as the earlier one, the one and a half times as transmissible as the earlier one. Okay, so here's a question. I'm going to try and make sense of it as I read it. Uh, he, uh, Karthik thanks you for the extremely informative lecture and his question is about the scale. Does the state have one model or ensemble of models of different cities or different kinds in the state? Uh, sorry, does, uh, does a state have um, uh, different kinds of models or an ensemble of models? What are the uncertainties involved in parameters taken uh, in each of these cases? Okay, already there's a nice question. It's a slightly technical question. Yes, so oh, many technical have, questions. So yes. you have to make a decision about what you want to model. Do you want to model the all of Karnataka? Do you want to model the districts of Karnataka? Do you want to model the towns in those districts of Karnataka? You know, the, the more sort of the, the smaller your basic unit, the less you can trust the type of model that I showed you earlier. You can trust them sort of large scale, very general <laughs> pictures of what's going on. But if it once you get to the question is will Shikantaya get to COVID-19 if he's in contact with so with Padmini, that's a harder question because they could, they could not. The smaller that unit, the more these sort of random little fluctuations become important and you have to take care of them. So right now, the model that exists, for example, the model that we work with, look at individual districts. So we do different models for each district of Karnataka. We look at how cases are rising and how deaths are changing in each of those districts. And we try and say that all of these aggregate up together into Karnataka as a whole. Then we also look at the numbers for Karnataka as a whole, and we try to compare it and see how do they relate between each other. Many districts of Karnataka don't do exactly the same thing. Some, in some of the cases rise, in some of the cases are low, in some they're not counting the cases accurately, in some they're not testing. So all of these distinctions we can try and make out in the modeling. But that's a good question. It's always a question of what is the right scale at which to model. So I can only say it should not be too small and too large doesn't make sense because different parts of it behave quite differently. So the, the sort of dreaded question, uh, predicting the next peak, how does one do that? And how does one believe that? So I can tell you how does one do that and I'll tell you how, what one can believe. Yeah. Okay. So one can, if you can see that all of this sort of mathematics tells you the peak, it tells you how it comes down. And if I know the reproductive ratio, which I get, if I can say that, look, here is my cases rising. This is the information that I get from cases rising, information that I get from deaths rising, information that I get from people going to hospitals and how that number is changing. Then I can sort of say that I'm on this part of the curve and sort of going up and I expect that to go up for a while. And partly this is because of inertia. Once things grow, it's sort of hard to stop it. You can't have cases that go to zero by tomorrow or day after. If I have a lockdown, that doesn't prevent my cases from going down immediately. It takes some time because there's some inertia built up in that particular system. So what we can do is say that, look, if, it, if trends go on, like we expect an increase over two weeks, if there are very, very stringent measures, it won't really alter that peak. It'll alter it after about 10 days, after about a week, after about two weeks. And then you will see that then when you get to that point, you have to redo your models and say, okay, now my numbers are coming down, my deaths are decreasing, my this thing. Let me redo the model to try and understand what the next 10 days or the next two weeks is going to be. So one thing is you should look at models that don't look too far in advance. You should not ask what's going to happen in September, what's going to happen in October, because that doesn't make sense. What happens then is depends very much on what you do now. If you have a lockdown now for one month, then cases will go down at the end of the month. There's absolutely no doubt about that although they may continue to go up for the next week. Mm -hmm. So you can think about the very short term as being yeah. reasonable for models to capture. You should not trust anything in the long term, anything more than a month you should not trust because too many things can happen in that month. And rough estimates for where peaks are and so on are hard to do. So one has to be very conscious of the level of uncertainty in here. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, people would like to, in many cases, it's important for governments to know because they have to be able to plan. How many hospital beds should there be? How many ICU should there be? So that's where these models become useful to government. And you cannot say that, look, I don't trust a model, I don't want this, because somebody has to make that choice. Somebody has to decide, I'm going to make, I'm going to allow for 10,000 more beds in the mm -hmm. city of Bangalore in the next week, because I think I'm going to need that many. So that's where models are really useful. 
So in a, in a way, it reminds me of the discussion on the monsoons, especially the Indian monsoons, although for a completely unrelated set of reasons why that also you you, you yeah. expect not to sort of look for very long term data. In fact, that yeah. you look for very short term data in order to make any kind of reliable uh, yeah. reliable prediction, which leads me into this question, you know, which I see a pattern now among the many, 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 many questions, apart from, you know, those thanking you for, for a fabulous lecture, of course, uh, uh, what people want to know is, is you know, uh, our questions around data. So could you sort of draw for us a brief, you know, uh, uh, map, so to speak, or, or well, no, but wrong context to use the word map, but where does data come from, you know, from serological studies, from this, from that, from that. So could you tell us, for example, where does, where does data that goes into modeling come from, especially in the Indian context, so that we can ground that idea a little bit more? How does one assess the reliability of that data? I mean, you've given us the other end of the thing where you're saying that, you know, short term, look at look at reliability in the short term, etc. And we can we can go towards that direction and ask, uh, you know, another question as to why were some studies, including as Jairaman says, the Imperial College model, etc, went so off the mark, etc. But I think let's start at what goes into the model, in order to then comment on what comes out of the model, right? Like its reliability or its logic is, is entirely sustained or destroyed or um, you know, um, made depend. I mean, made depend entirely on what goes in uh, to the model. So, could you could you give us an overview on what goes into a model, okay. and therefore then what okay. one does with what comes out? So, the model that I showed you had this had you know it, it's had a set of equations that I didn't spend any time on, but those equations have certain terms in them. These are called parameters, and these parameters determine how things go up and things go down. So, all of the magic of modeling lies in what parameters you choose. Those parameters you fix by looking at the sort of data that is available to you. For example, what is the daily count of cases? How many new cases has Bangalore reported between yesterday and today, today and tomorrow, tomorrow? So that's the sort of rising part of the curve with the number of cases are increasing in Bangalore. This relies on reports. For example, for all of Karnataka, for all states, each district provides a report of the number of cases, the number of deaths, the number of hospitalizations, et cetera. These feed into a statewide prediction, and all of these are aggregated together, put together by the Indian Council of Medical Research, which produces a number for all of India, saying this is how much that number has increased, et cetera. What about quality of data? There are a couple of different issues here. One is that it has to do with the disease itself. Unlike a large number of other diseases where you know that you're sick, a large number of people with COVID-19 will not know that they're sick. It's only when they go to get tested that they will discover that they're positive. And they're called what are called asymptomatic. So automatically there is an uncertainty there because the number of people who you are testing as being positive is probably far less than the number of people who are actually positive for the disease. So that's one source of uncertainty. The moment your testing drops, it's another source of uncertainty because you have no estimate of what is the number of people, even as a good fraction, even if I say that 20 times the number of people, number of people I'm actually detecting is the number of, is, is the total number of cases. If I'm not even detecting that number actually because my testing is low, then I can't make any sensible statement at all. So the way one tries to work around that is to look at what is called the test positivity ratio. How many tests of the tests that I'm conducting, how many are positive? The larger that number is, if 50% of the tests are positive that I conduct, then pretty much I can just pick a random person off the street and it's 50% it's likely that they'll test positive. So the smaller that number is, the more you can be sure you've controlled your epidemic and you can trust the numbers that are coming out of it. Because there are other ways. One is that you need to rely on journalists to look at the numbers and see if they make sense to report on them and say that, look, there are many, many more deaths that they're actually seen than the numbers are showing. People are hiding deaths. And for whatever reason, they're just not being recorded in the proper way, in the way that is sent up to the government. So that's where people have to talk about the quality of data. We have to figure out many different ways of understanding is the data correct or not. But right now, we are facing an unprecedented problem. People are, you know, there are, there's a large discrepancy between the number of deaths, the, the real number of deaths that we believe, and the number of people who are listed as having been as having died in government, uh, in, in, in government communications. We're not testing enough. Our test positivities are very high. So we really don't have a track of how many people there actually are who are infected. All of this is very, very difficult to deal with in a modeling term. You can allow, you can have very large uncertainties in the model, and that's where we are moving for. And at this point, it's really becoming very difficult because those uncertainties overwhelm any sort of sensible prediction that you might have been able to make. Um, Akriti would like to know 
is there any way to estimate the mutations that a virus could go through? I don't know if this is your domain, but if you had any indicative answer. Yeah, so the, 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 the coronavirus, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus doesn't mutate all that fast, on, in relative, relatively speaking. I think there are probably about roughly two mutations, two to four mutations per month is probably some good ballpark figure. They, for various technical reasons that have to do with viruses. So you do know how many changes it can accumulate. And, it's, and, and so that you have a rough sort of clock that tells you by so much, there would have been so many mutations. Most mutations don't do anything it's important to stress. Most mutations in the virus don't really affect the virus's ability to infect you, to, you know, to make it worse for you or, or to make it better for you on average. It's only a few mutations that are actually important enough that they can improve the way the virus comes and attacks your cells or lead to more serious consequences. It's these that we have to be conscious of and it's these that we have to watch out for. Okay. Um, some, uh, someone whose name now I, have, I can't see here asked a question where they asked, is there a concrete example you can give of the kind of modeling that we discussed was conducted by a country and it was sort of useful and helped manage the disease in uh, that population? So I think all of government projections, anything that any government does, yeah. if it's a sensible government, will rely on projections. Government, you have to have a projection. You have to understand what is happening in the next two weeks. If there's any other way to do it that is better than a model, I'm happy to do that. And it's not, it's not that one is sort of wedded to models. It's just that the question of how many hospital beds will I expect in Bangalore City three weeks from now? Because I have to now plan for that. I cannot summon up 10,000 beds out of nowhere in the morning if I, need, if I know that I will need it by evening. So modeling goes into all of these things. You may not be told about it. But any projection of what might happen in the future, what are the stresses that the health system is going to deal with, how many oxygen cylinder you need, how many you know, crematoria you might need, let's say in this current somewhat depressing scenario, all of these require an ability to project into the future. And an ability to project into a future using mathematics is just a simply a mathematical model. So we, the, the- Is there a concrete example you can give where, where you know, in a way, um, the ability to model led to a reliable outcome uh, or response from the government. So I think this is more an evaluation of the government than the model itself, but if you might I, venture to. So I think in, in many cases, governments have not done what modelers have told them that they should do, and they have <laughs> suffered the consequences. Hmm. So I think that is probably a better way of putting it. Modeling hmm. usually gives you a sort of range of possibilities. And it says that, you know, the, the, the funny thing about being a modeler or thinking about models is that it's good for you if you're wrong. That if you predict something that's, that's terrible and you can convince your government to say that, look, I'm going to take action now so that something terrible doesn't happen later. Hmm. Now, the model is wrong because the number of cases have gone down, whereas you predict it to go up. But that's a good thing. So the job of models is also to tell you these counterfactual scenarios that what might happen under a certain set of circumstances, but expecting that you will take action to prevent that from happening. And that's important to remember. Hmm. Uh, Ruchita would like to know if there's a trade-off between virulence and transmissibility and if yes how do we go about understanding it um not an ob not an obvious trade-off that mm -hmm. i mean virulence usually a very virulent virus manages to kill off people it infects very fast and therefore it, it closes off all the routes to infecting other people so that virus will not last very long so a more transmissible virus is, of course, a good sort of, you know, it mixes up everything all the way together. So a more transmissible, less virulent virus is probably the long-term trajectory over some evolutionary time scale of, of, of SARS-CoV-2, of the virus that causes COVID-19. These two are not obviously linked to each other. Hmm. Hmm. Uh... It's a speculative question. And again, one which I sort of, I'm not, I'm not sure again, like the previous one, if there's a correlation at all uh, of any kind, but I'll ask you anyway, when Nandish would like to know if, uh, I, I hope it's partly tongue in cheek, if this pandemic is, is another way of natural selection and how would it affect us as a species? Natural selection doesn't work like that. I mean, it's sort of, uh, it, this is, I think much more an ecological event rather than sort of it's a fact that human beings think that they own the world they're sort of pushing against every ecological boundary that there is 
And at some point, you know, the, 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 there are larger consequences to that. You're coming into contact with exotic animals, exotic wildlife that you would never have encountered under normal circumstances. Maybe some tribe somewhere in Arunachal Pradesh might have encountered them, but not you. But now you're facing the consequences of that, of a certain way in which you assume that you have complete right and domain over all the ecological world that surrounds you. And there are consequences of that that follow. That I, I would think of that as being an explanation. Okay. So, unfortunately, I'm going to have to stop here, even though there are seriously lots and lots of questions which remain unanswered. Do come along. As I said at the start, we have a lecture series that runs through the 45 days. So there are 20 more lectures to go, all from scholars as fabulous as Gautam today. And you will be able to ask many of these questions going forward. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, share with you is that one of the reasons why we can't hold Gautam back here now is because he's about to take literally a four minute break and go into a tutorial session with young, with young adults, basically. So what we do, with our lectures, and this is so this is not obvious because it's not an obvious form of public engagement yet. I hope it becomes more uh, the norm as we go forward. Is that after every lecture, uh, every lecturer basically gives a set of readings which are shared with a small group of young scholars who register first come first serve basis, and they get time with the speaker where they can then ask more detailed questions. So especially among the, for the young amongst you, between the ages of 15 to 28, we strongly encourage you to look out for these tutorial sessions so that you can ask many more questions in a more relaxed manner. So sorry, Gautam, for, for giving you literally a four minute break. Thank you everyone for being here, but thank you most of all, Gautam, for a fabulous lecture, for clarifying and laying bare a ways in which, you know, many of us can grapple with the information that we are dealing with in a situation that is otherwise quite terrifying. So thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you very much for the audience, for your engagement, for your questions. Do come back for the other lectures. And I hope you have a wonderful evening, whatever's left of it. Thank you again. <laughs>